Three, two, and one. Welcome to Pivotal Point, brought to you by Wave Soda, New Wave Soda. Check them out, wavesoda.com. Of course, on this show, we get into uh, career paths and choices that we make and how those impact our lives uh, moving forward. My next guest is a guy that I've uh, known since Little League Baseball, I think. Went to high school together, and uh, his his path, his trajectory has been Really a lot of fun to watch. Uh, he, of course, is best known for OJ Made in America, Requiem for the Big East. He's got three HBO Sports documentaries, and I believe he's got a movie coming out about Roberto Clemente. Ezra Edelman joins me on Pivotal Point. What's up, man? Thanks for coming on. Hi, Frank. How are you? <laughs> First off, let me ask you this. You, you won an Oscar. Um, I did. I yeah, it really is one of like the. I'm trying to think of like all the trophies in the world. Like one, I'd want the NBA trophy, and then two, I'd want an Oscar. Where is that Oscar right now? Is it right next to you? And uh, honestly, slightly embarrassingly, <laughs> it is on. It is on a top shelf in my living room, okay. and which is weird for me because I'm not that. I, I guess I am that dude. I'm not that dude. Like I think for. Yeah. Just moved to a new apartment, and for a few years, it was like in the back, right, right, table in the back of my house in the bedroom. Like, so yeah, so I'm like, all right, I'll, I guess I'll flex a little bit if someone walks in my apartment and be like, all right, I do some Oscar. <laughs> when people have like movers like came in, they're like, is that enough? You know, like, <laughs> I'm surprised it's not behind you, because like with all the Zoom shots these days, you know, everybody wants to have something behind. Yeah, them. That, that would that would be cool. <laughs> hey. Um, like I mentioned in the in the uh, intro, known each other uh, for gosh, almost forty years now, and I, I I don't know if I've ever asked this, but at what point did you realize this is what you wanted to do? Maybe I have, but you know, refresh my memory. When did you say, you know what, I want to I want to produce, I want to direct, I want to do this type of thing? When did that happen? I'm like, I'm like a, uh, you know, I'm still I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do. I'm not even like I'm not even kidding. I uh, I've never. I've I've been very fortunate to be able to find situations that I'll say situations, jobs, whatever mm -hmm. that interest me. And so I, I feel like my path has been a very logical one to where I'm at. But I honestly, from the time I started um, in the workforce as a like when I graduated from college, it was always like one step in front of the next and like going someplace to do something, learning a skill or craft, figure out something I like more, somewhere between interest and opportunity and experience sort of led to the next thing. But to answer your question, I, you know, I never set out at any point when I was younger. The only thing I ever wanted to do when I was a kid was be a professional baseball player. So it's like, since then, I figured <laughs> that wasn't going to happen when I was a teenager. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, so I never really, I never really did that. And like, I actually think about that a lot because a lot of my people I know and friends um, in this business, a lot of, uh, a lot of people went to film school, especially people who do scripted stuff. And in that way, the sort of sense of, and I've, I still have not done anything in this in this space, but I've been developing stuff and working on stuff. You know, it makes it sort of adds to this huge feeling of being an imposter, because it's like a lot of people. This was their dream to be able to make movies, right. and went to film school or were shooting movies when they were a kid. It's like basically, honestly, the way we were as athletes, and you even more so than me, because you're just a better athlete than me. But like, you know, like I spent all my time when I was a kid, like wanting to figure out a way to hit a baseball and like that's what I did with my time to like be the best left-handed hitter in the history of the world and you know there are cats out there who were like had little cameras and are making movies right kids and like so when you know that there are people who grew up doing that and then you sort of are sitting in a place where you're trying to do the same thing it's hard not to feel like an imposter because I you know and with whatever I do I don't do anything on a lark I feel like if I'm gonna do it I want to do something as well as possible mm -hmm. and so you know with that comes a lot of sort of humility and doubt mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the idea of trying to take on something you haven't done before but whatever that's a long way of saying I never in my <laughs> at all had, had and then by the way documentary is the same thing it's just more like what are my interests like sports journalism, you know, movies and like those interests have sort of like intersected as I've gotten older and I've been at places where I've allowed to like practice a craft, but not through any sort of plan that was thought out at any point. Interesting. I wanted to ask you about 
perfection because you mentioned it a little bit there. You know, doing on-air stuff or, or calling games or being a sports broadcaster. I assume that producing and directing and writing, how often do you look back at what you've done and say, oh, I could have done that better or oh, that, that doesn't feel right or are you not a perfectionist and you just roll with the punches? No, I am a perfectionist and like probably, to, I mean, I don't know if it's to my detriment or not, but like in the last few years, I would say it's to my detriment because um, it's more like I'm used to being sort of offered or given or just sort of, uh, you know, uh, or find a piece of clay, like a smaller piece of clay and you just do it and you work on it until like you, mm. and you know, this idea of, of, of being an artist and you see the purity of some artists who, you know, in that sort of more, I don't, I don't, I don't even know, like this idealistic idea of an artist of they wake up in the morning, they have to paint because that's who they are. They have to take pictures, they have to whatever. Um, and I know so many people who are just, they do things cause they're there, they're interested. They're going to go pursue their process oriented. I think I've always been way too results driven. And so when I'm doing something, it's like, Oh, I now am tasked with doing this documentary or making this movie or whatever it is, doing a piece on real sports. I'm going to take all of my energy and put it into this thing until the clock runs out and I'm going to make it as perfect as possible. And like to like frames and sounds and right. all stuff. And when I don't have that thing, and so I'm less of though a natural artist where it feels like I might, like I could read an article in the paper and say like, oh, that's interesting. And my mind doesn't connect to the fact that I could actually do something with that article now. I could be like, oh, I like that article. I could option the article or call someone up. My, but it's almost like if someone said, oh, did you read that article? We optioned that article. Are you interested in doing it? I'd be like, oh yeah, maybe. And so, but I think for now, it's so I guess for me, the bigger the scope of things in terms of perfectionism, it's sort of you, you end up being sort of imprisoned by your expectations of like, oh, I have to, anything I do, it has to be perfect. And if I can't, what's the point in trying? And that's not a great place to live because I also still thrive on being creative and creative output and, and like a good day's work, you know, sort of is as a, it's a very fulfilling, necessary you know, concept. And so when you are sitting around because you don't have that clay to mold, or you're trying to do something that's so big and ambitious, that is, it's that much harder to, to do. You feel like you're not actually doing the things that would sustain you um, as an artist, filmmaker, whatever it is. And so the, I don't know, I'm like losing all your questions, but like, no, 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 I, I love I'm, it. I'm totally a perfectionist. And so even with the things I do, like, I see contemporaries and friends of mine like make films and like I'm in the middle of doing something that like will be another like I, I like had fits and starts and like tried to do things in the last few years that didn't didn't take off, didn't work. And, you know, it was very like humbling and also like and maddening and depressing. And then you see people are just like, oh, they just made a movie or they just made a movie. And like for me, it's like like the idea of perfection is one thing. The idea of envy is another thing. It's like just trying to like control your own path yeah. you know, because it's like, because I'm always like, Oh, I had a, like, I feel so much pressure to like put shit out. Yeah. And like in the end, now I'm actually working on something in production about something. And like, if I just want to put something out we could put something out. Right. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, but it's like, it's a maddening yeah. concept because it's yeah. like, and then doing things for me is not, I wouldn't call it fun. Right. Just like right. It, it's, it's so like there's a, I mean, as you get older, the existential crisis of you want to keep doing things well, but you also know the process that you have to go through to do things well. And you think it has to get easier, but it doesn't get easier. In some ways it gets harder based on other responsibilities, be it family in your case and other things, whatever. And then you're like, how do I maintain the same standard and how do I the same focus, the same? And I think those are for me, like the bigger dilemmas. Name of the show, of course, is Pivotal Point. And I wanted to ask you in your life, your career, where was that big shift? If there was one where you went from X to Y or A to B, it really changed your, your landscape. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I'm gonna reference, um, our mutual friend, John Bernthal, and I listened to your um, 
pivotal point with him. And, you know, like John had like, John was a wild boy, as he said, and like lived this life. And I looked at that, I was like, oh, I don't, that ain't me. <laughs> I think I'm like the opposite. Like John was a risk taker and I've always been aver averse to risk. And so I actually think that one of the, so my pivotal point, mm -hmm. like sort of uh, reflective of that was so relatively passive in the sense that I, you asked me about my trajectory and like, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, you know, I steadily, you know, I had a job, I, I got a job working in TV as an Olympic researcher out of college and, and quickly to give you my resume and like went and because that was a very well thought of job, someone gave me a job as a producer on a show for a year, like a syndicated t doing um, little features on Olympic athletes. And I was like, oh, okay, you want to give me a job doing something I didn't know how to do? I'm like, cool, I'll do that. And then a year later, I'm like, I sort of, I'm bored by this, or I figured this out. Mm -hmm. And then I had friends who worked at HBO, worked on real sports, and they're like, do you want to come and work here as an as a associate producer? Sure. And like, I was very lucky, and I was given the opportunity very quickly after I got there to start working as a producer. So I, then I'm like, I'm at HBO, I'm 25 years old, and I'm working on real sports, and it's like, great. Also didn't know what I was doing, never been on two, didn't know how to work with a correspondent or two camera shoot. Mm -hmm. And you sort of go through the first process of like, failing and then you figure it out quickly. It's sort of, there is a level that's funny that I think the competitiveness of an athlete comes in and you're like, I don't want to embarrass myself. I do not want to lose and you do not like that feeling. Yeah. You know, you're like, so, but like, and so for me, this trajectory of very quickly to be like work on real sports. And then I had a couple moments where there's a moment uh, in 2000 and I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. I will get to answer your question. But I, the one thing I can say is like, there was a moment in 2005, 30, 30. And I just, I was in the middle of working on a piece for real sports. It was a piece about Vin Scully. I don't know, whatever, it's fine. And it happened that in the course of me working on that piece, I was at home and one night I used to play a lot of basketball. So I was playing basketball at like a late game on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And I got into some, I, I got hurt. I got, I hurt my back. I like rammed into some like, whatever thing on the court and like I like couldn't move so it was one of these things where I ended up like a friend of mine who played ball was like literally to carry me into my apartment and I was in my bed and like I spent the next like week in my bed not being able to move at all like I was like and I had this moment where I was like I'm doing this story I don't really care about it I'm doing it you know I work on a show where it's Hallmark is called Colin Card is investigative journalist I'm not really an investigative journalist that's not the kind of stuff I I'm good at I like telling stories, but like so it's almost like what I do is softer in terms of what versus what the show is, and also you're working with correspondence, so it's not really your thing. I just really remember having this thought of like, is this all there is? I was like, this is it for me, right? right. Like, because in some ways, I was really unimaginative. I like, I think I was so sort of hell bent on following the rules. You went to school, you did this, and you're like, all right, I've worked in these institutions and structures. Um, so fortunately for me you know, within the year, at least at HBO, they did sports docs. And so I got the opportunity to work on a on a sports documentary about the Brooklyn Dodgers. And that was the first thing I did that I was like, oh, this is really suits me. Like, I love the breadth of it. I love the history of it. I love being able to interview people, which I'd never had the opportunity to really do. And I'm like, this was my, and like having to really sink into something for, you know, close to a year to be able to do something. And this was like, I loved it. It was like, I, I don't think I've actually had more fun doing anything professionally than the first documentary I got to make. And I just took to it. It was, you know, and I was in sort of fed my obsessive nature. Mm -hmm. And so I did a few documentaries for, for HBO. And then you start to go, it's like, it's like anything in terms of how do you grow? How do you grow creatively? How do you, my life had gotten a little better there, but it's like, and there's a little bit of like, I get paid a salary to make documentaries I'm interested in that people seem to like. I'm like, this is the dream job, except that then you start to go, I make documentaries and they're all sort of historical in nature. They're all about sports. They're all narrated by Liev Schreiber. <laughs> they're all like a product of HBO sports. And it's sort of like, I know that I'm good at what I do. I work really hard, yeah. but like there was just like a relative, like, and I'm an anonymous person. Yeah, I'm just a cog in the machine. Right. And like, yeah, if you do something really well and you win an award, like you get to go up somewhere and like accept it. But like, it just felt like you're, you're just like representing this thing. I mean, whether it's ego or whether it's whatever, but I was like very like frustrated. 
And I didn't know what to do. Like I just with myself, I was like, here I am. I have no wherewithal in terms of how knowing how the world works. So I'm like, I have a job that pays me pretty well. Mm-hmm. And I find people like the shit I do. And well, where am I supposed to like, if I like, I can complain, which I'm really good at, <laughs> what am I going to do? I had no wherewithal to do stuff on my own. Uh, so, mm-hmm. and like at that point, um, my colleague, my colleague, my this dude, Connor Shell, who started 30 for 30 with Bill Simmons, who strangely has a DC connection. And I, I mean, I grew up a little bit with her sister, his sister hit her, his sister. And so like we had a little personal connection and we started like meeting for lunch around the time that um, he had started 30 for 30. And we were just talking about sports docs in general. And I would just be like, yeah, you know, I think what you're doing is dumb and you're doing too many new stories or small stories. So we would, and he's always like, if you ever want to do something for us, that'd be great. I was like, sure. It was like nice to have some feeling of mm-hmm. All this being said, I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. I was very frustrated with things, but I had my job and I was like waiting for the next thing I was doing. And then one day, well, first of all, the head of HBO Sports left or what, however it worked, mm-hmm. like this guy, Ross Greenberg. The next thing you know, there were no more sports talks. Like the, com- the company was like, we're not doing this anymore. They'd sort of been the baby of Ross. Oh, uh, yeah. And so it was like, what now? And it was like one of these things where, you know, we I'd worked really hard. There's like a, there's honestly like a group of two, three or four of us who are documentary producers. And like people like our stuff, we work really hard. And next thing you know, they're like, we're not doing this anymore. And it felt like we were really being devalued as mm-hmm. for who we were. And then what they did was they said, well, you can work on real sports. You can go back and work on the thing you were working on before, which for me was a mm-hmm. regression. Or you can leave. Like, or be like, we're not firing you, but like, <laughs> we're not firing you. Right. Like, right. And, like, and so I was like, mm, all right, I'm out. Now, I'm out, by the way, because they were going to essentially demote me. Mm-hmm. So I, got, I, I left and I got, you know, like a severance for, you know, almost a year. So I was like, okay, but I remember the day where I was told that like you no longer have a job doing what you're doing. I just remember this feeling of the void. Mm-hmm. Of, like, I'd always worked some way, so I'd always had a job, and like just being like, I actually that day I went to the U.S. Open. It was a Friday, and I went somehow like I was watching tennis. I just remember staring out, and I just was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to. Oh shit! Do. Okay. Do. Yeah. And. To answer your question, this is why I say it's passive because I didn't know what to do. All I knew was I don't have a job. I'm okay financially for the minute, for a minute because they're giving me some money, and then uh, I'll hopefully something will happen. But I wasn't like, all right, man, I'm going to start my own company. And, ah. and what happened was Connor came to me and said, and I wasn't even like, I'm going to pitch a sports stock. I'm like, I know what I want to do. I'm going to go to ESPN and mm-hmm. do this. They came to me and they said, how would you feel about doing a doc about the Big East? And I was like, okay. But even, but I was like more like, okay, but about a conference? Like, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. so I just thought about it, but like I had like, oh, actually I skipped a step. Not that this is a big deal and it's a little weird, but like I like wanted to make a documentary about John Thompson. And like it was a very funny thing where that was gonna be my thing. I was like, all right, here's something I a subject that I care deeply about and I know about, and through some channels, like you know, I met with him and he sort of given me the okay to do it, and I started working on it. And like, look, you know, Big John, I saw what you said about after he passed, like great man. Yeah. Difficult dude. <laughs> Did not take kindly to me. Oh, no. <laughs> he like thought I was like after something with him. Right, like, right. Any questions? We're talking to people. He's like, kind of like, what the fuck? And who the fuck are you? Kind of next yeah. thing, he like, kicked me in the curb. And I was like, wait, so this is the first thing I'm doing on my own? It was like demoralizing. Sure. And I was like, maybe I don't like what, you know. And so I got thrown a lifeline in doing this Big East film, which sort of, you know, coincidentally had something to do with that subject and he finally by the way was took him he was the last person to agree to do a interview because he just thought I was um but to answer your questions like I did something that I was like it's there okay mm-hmm. I did it as well as I could it was like and it was also like as much as it was a creative challenge it was like a whole different challenge of how do I do this on my own which is 
First, I work with an independent production company. How does that going to work? I don't know you people, but like, I don't have the infrastructure to physically do this. And then you sort of start to you start to rejigger how you do what you're used to doing. It's all a process. So I actually cut that film in my apartment, and like an editor would come to my apartment every day. And like, I luckily I had like a two floors, and he could be up there. And it was like, but there was like this really lovely feeling that came with doing something like is like a DIY feeling more than other things. And so I did that and like the doc's fine, whatever. And, you know, and then the, basically the notion of OJ came up and they asked me to do it. And like, but this is typical me. I'm just like, I don't want to do that. And this yeah. is why it's been done, you know? And so like, I'm always like, nah, nah, and then it all. And so like, that's what I'm saying. I'm the worst example of like a pivotal point. <laughs> I just don't do anything. But, so but, I get really lucky and like, right. like okay. Don't do but, that. But there, but there was a moment, you know, the back thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, look, I, I mean, I, I think there's no, I mean, look, I've, I've truly become. Hmm. In some ways, I'm exactly the same person I've always been. I'm exactly the same person you've known forever. In terms of like, I, I haven't evolved in many terrible ways. <laughs> but I do think certain sort of like ideas about life and choices and being a little bit more in touch with my own desires and and connection to the world which is always frankly a scary place and and when you get older and you realize you don't control your fate in the same way um these and like and you lose confidence based on things that you're not sure has to do with you or not was i not good at this like what like i was really good at this and you basically fired me and like again i'm like who like and like yeah. that's not fair and then you're like it doesn't matter <laughs> like all i can do is like, that's not fair i think i got screwed or like or like why don't you acknowledge i get i do these things really well oh now you don't like and so it doesn't matter what your ego says or what your but then you can lose confidence and then you know if someone else believes in you then you and you still have to believe in your obviously you have to believe in yourself um but like i'm more of a testament of people who have been very who've seen something in me and have given me a chance to do things and and that's has and all i can do is when i've had a chance to do things do them in my own way to the best of my ability and actually care and like do them obsessively and do them as well yeah. as you can and i really did have an ethos when i was younger of I feel like if for what you're good at doing, if you do it to the best of your abilities, hopefully you will be rewarded. Because whatever we're talking about, like I saw no specific path to ever doing anything. I didn't have some grand vision of life. No. Like I lived in the same shitty apartment until last year that I'd lived in like 17 years. My <laughs> friends were like, you know, and my, and my brother's like, you can, you need to just, <laughs> like I was sort of like, I'm such a creature of my own like professional habits. And then like, I never thought out beyond my own. And so as soon as you start to, th that also you start to think about these other things. And then I'm like, oh, I'm still the person who actually is this dude who just wants that big, big ball of clay to mold. That's yeah. what I want. And when you start thinking about these other things out there in the world, it, it can confuse the issue. Yeah, for sure. Speaking I, of confusion, uh, I wanted to ask you this because, you know, the great thing about um, the OJ documentary was, you know, I thought I knew a lot of stuff and I really didn't know anything about the whole backstory, Los Angeles and police brutality and all and all that. And the last four or five years since that film came out, there have been so many uh, issues, events that could be in 20, 25 years, 30 years from now, a documentary. So I'm sort of putting you on the spot here. Has there been anything in the last five, six years I mean, there are a ton of them that has piqued your interest to like, well, maybe we could dive deeper into this issue. I think, if, you know, obviously the, the given one would be Kaepernick, uh, you know, Trump and his dealings with with pro sports players. Is there anything that st uh, sticks out to you? Uh, I think that when the Kaepernick thing gets done, it'll be it'll be good. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, I mean, from a sports standpoint, I mean, look, I, I mean, I think this the other simple thing I'd say is that there's a reason why like the, that film, the OJ film kind of could get, it's like you needed a certain, you need a certain distance. Yes. 
um, to like yeah. be able to like see it and connect things and sort of also have people be comfortable with talking, even though a lot of people weren't. Um, and so it's hard to like be still in the middle of, of the muck and the mess and be like, all right, mm-hmm. so this is what this is going to be and how it's going to be. And so I don't know. And like, and truth be told, you know, it's funny. Like I sort of feel like after I did, I mean, OJ to me was like this great story because it was about kind of everything. And as I've been trying to like evolve out of a space that's exclusive um, within sports, being like, okay, so that was like a good bridge because it wasn't. And so I've been trying to do more stuff out, whether it's, so like, I, I haven't really thought that much about, I mean, Kaepernick would be like, like really relevant example, but yeah. on that, there haven't been a lot of stories that I have thought much about okay. in terms of what they, you know, and I'm sure there'll be a big story, another mm-hmm. story about, which he will be a part of active, you know, athletes and activism, mm-hmm. and sort of, you know, this newer generation of athletes who really, and then in some ways that's all within a continuum of a story that actually involves OJ. Um, right. so, you know, but yeah, I mean, there's always, and you know, what's also I think hard is the media landscape here now is so, as you know, it's, it's too much. So like, I don't care. Like, it's just like, I watch what I watch and I like them, but I'm like, yeah. no, I don't. So it's like, it's like, there's such overkill yeah. and it doesn't really make me want to engage on. Right. Uh, a few more X's and O's question about directing and producing and writing a documentary versus a major motion picture. Is that on your docket, correct? Like that's the next step for you. No, there- no not necessarily. I mean, like, let's just say that, like you mentioned Clemente, I, I've been, attached to or tried to work on now like three different oh, okay. in the last, including Clemente and it's not like not happening or not existing. Yeah. But, you know, when I learned about Hollywood, just to use that, it's like, I, you know, <laughs> it's not that simple. And also the movie business, especially now is really challenging. And so yeah. you could have like a, I worked, I've worked really hard with a talented writer working on Clemente and we wrote and we got to a point where I thought we had like created, like really found the story within it. But then it's like, well, how much does it cost? Oh, it's here. It's, it's too much for a story. And then it's about the economics and the demographics and then this, and like, can you, can you find someone who's going to play an actor? Like, it's like all these different things is it, you know, and it's beyond, it's, it's sort of like, it's beyond my control. So I've gone through processes on three different films now where it's been really hard because I think, as I said, like I do pour everything into something and then for something not to happen, and have no guarantee for it not to happen right. has been really challenging for me. Right. So, you know, what's happened with me is I've, those are a few things I've been working on here and there. And like, again, I still hope to make a movie about Roberto Clemente. I just can't say it's gonna happen like imminently. Right. Um, and I've been developing a, a TV show for a few years that, I won't tell you about in this form, but I'll tell you about it off like (laughs) jinx it. Yeah, Yeah, right. I'm working on another big documentary project. And so I'm in the middle of shooting and it's another multi hour, multi part thing. Oh, awesome. And uh, and again, I'm a weirdo and just feel like nah. I don't need to talk about it publicly because (laughs) you love talking about yourself. (laughs) I don't need to talk about it. Um so like so the answer to your question was like I sort of went back to what I know to do, or like, I was sort of like, what do you do when you get to a point with right. that you actually know how to do? And it was like, keep pushing yourself creatively, like avail yourself of an opportunity that you never thought you had, but you actually had no experience in, or do you double down and like finally be rewarded for doing the thing that you know how to do? It's very strange, especially in the content universe is all over the place. And so there's a lot of opportunities now in document. And so it's like, for me, I, like, I was like, why am I going down this road of trying to do something I don't know how to do that like, makes me like lose sleep at night 